Welcome ladies and gentlemen to Integrated Math 2. In today's episode we will be discussing chapter 1.2.2 which is perimeters and areas of enlarging patterns. So if we look at the handout that we've been given and you should be able to find this handout on canvas the figure that is being enlarged we are supposed to figure out an enlarging pattern. Now we've done things like this before in the Integrated 1 class where the figure enlarged using a linear formula uh, using the tile growth patterns. This is just taking it one step further. So if we look at the figure, figure one, each black square is only one and it creates this weird looking shape right here. The figure two of this rug design is the same thing except now instead of one space by one space, it's two spaces by two spaces and then figure three unimaginatively is three spaces by three spaces. So by the time you hit figure four, it should be four spaces by four spaces for each for each block here. So it'll look like that. I'm gonna skip four spaces and then do another four more and then it will fill in. I'll go ahead and pause and do that and then come back. That way I don't waste you guys' time. Cool. By the time you get to figure five it should look like this where there are five squares being cut out for each one. Uh, figure four as you can see I kind of filled it in right there, but each each square is four squares worth. So now it says describe figure 20 of your design. Provide as much information as you can. So we can start off just by providing the, sh the general shape of it. You can say that uh, figure 20 will look in the same pattern, but each block will be 20 squares by 20 squares, or you can even say it's 20 by 20. And now we can talk about what the area and the perimeter are going to be because we actually were supposed to be doing that the entire time, but if we haven't done it, it's not a big deal. We can say the area will be something and then the perimeter will be something. I have no idea what that is yet, but we will find out right now. So we look at figure one, right? Um, we're gonna do each one of these. Now keep in mind the white spaces are part of the rug. They just they just spaced them out like that so you could differentiate the colors. So looks like we're getting three up, three sides, that's six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So the perimeter here is twelve. Now here you can go ahead and count the squares if you want to, but if everything is being multiplied by two, right? Like this side of one becomes a side of two, the bottom side of one becomes a side of two, then it makes sense that the entire perimeter would have been doubled, right? So if we do, uh, if we go with that logic, then I feel like we're gonna get 24, but don't take my word for it. We could say this is two, four, six, two, four, six, so six plus six is 12, uh, 14, 16, 18, uh, 20, 22, and 24 for the bottom space here. So again, following that pattern, I believe all we have to do is we just have to take the 12 and then multiply him by three, right? Because now each block is three squares long. So making this guy 36. And as long as we know our 12 times times tables, then I believe this perimeter here can become 48. And then the perimeter here will become 60. So in case you didn't notice the pattern, it's not a big deal. This figure here, perimeter one, Figure one was 12 times one, 12 times two, 12 times three. This is how I'm getting all of these numbers right here. 12 times four happens to be 48 and 12 times five happens to be 60. So why don't we go and, why don't we go and enter that in? And actually it's not the perimeter will me, it's the perimeter will be. I apologize for that little typo right there. That. And the perimeter will be whatever 12 times 20 is. So whatever 12 times 20 is, looks like I'm getting to get 240. Okay, let's go and take a look at area. Okay, let's go ahead and... Okay, let's go and take a look at area. I'm gonna go ahead and change colors for this one. So in this case, the area the area is just the space on the inside, so I can just go and count this. This is one, two, three, four, five, six squares. So I think that's gonna be six units. This one here, the area can be calculated the same way, except instead of 
one, two, three, four, five, six, right? Because each of these is not one square. Each of these is four squared. So I can actually call him six times four. And then in this case, the area would be one, two, three, four, five. Again, six of those blocks, but within each block there are nine. And I think we're hopefully seeing a pattern here where this becomes six times, looks like 16, right? There are 16 filled in squares right here. And then this guy would be six times, looks like 25. And then from here, that means that the area of this guy would be six times, now be careful, it's not gonna be 20, right? Because this is 20 by 20, so I believe when you have a 20 by 20 figure, the number of squares inside is going to be 400. Now, what we're trying to get you to see is we're trying to get you to see a pattern here. Notice how there were six blocks here, and each of these was two by two, giving me four, three by three, giving me nine, four by four, giving me 16, five by five, giving me 25, and I'm hoping you're starting to see what's happening between those numbers, the, what's happening between those threes, that's getting me the nine. What's happening between those twos, getting me the four. Between the fours, getting me the 16, and so on and so forth. And this is how I got the 400 right here. So this ends up becoming 2400. So we'll reconvene in just a second. I'm gonna go and copy and paste the rest of this worksheet in. Give me a second. Okay, the next part of this is asking us to graph our findings for perimeter as well as put those perimeter values in the table given. So I think we already have those perimeter values, so I'll go and just label them in like 12, 24, 36, 48, 60, and then this ended up being 240. So I'll go and label the y-axis. You gotta scale it somewhat appropriately, but I think the general shape should be the same for everybody. So. I'll do 10, skip one for that for 20, then 30, skip one for 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. We're not gonna hit our 240, but that's okay. I don't think the x-axis go, goes that far anyway. The one will be 12, so that's gonna be just a little bit above 10. The two is gonna be 24, so that's gonna be, 20 was right here, so I'll go and just go just a little bit under halfway to 30. Three was 36, so here's 30. Uh, that's gonna be 40, so just a little bit here, a little bit more than halfway. Again, it's not totally perfect. Uh, I think uh, if we were given a, whoa, thank you, no viruses. Uh, four will go to 48, so just a little bit under 50, and I believe that is 50 right there. And then uh, five hits exactly at 60. Now, not that it's asking you to, but if it did ask you to connect the dots, you would notice, whoa, something a little more there we go, like that. Something a little more straight like that. Now, of course, the dots are just a little bit off, but that's because of the you know, human error right there when it comes to being able to guesstimate where some of these more precise values are. But at this point, we should be able to determine that the shape of the graph is none other than linear. Perimeter is a linear function, which should make sense, right? We are adding a constant amount each time. To, uh, to, to, to our perimeters, and as we saw from integrative one, when we are adding a constant amount, that constant amount being added becomes the slope of the line, and that is how we get the equation for this, uh, for this linear function right here. We would say y equals our slope is 12x, right, because our constant change is 12. Uh, remember, we don't get our y-intercept from figure one, we get our y-intercept from figure zero, and since we're adding 12 to move right, we would subtract 12 to move left, which means we are simply 12x only. Hopefully that makes sense. I'm gonna cut and paste the area. Give me a second and we will finish this up. So here we are with area. I already pre-filled in these, uh, these values for the figure numbers. I didn't wanna keep scrolling up and down. You guys already have these on your paper in front of you. Um, so from here, let's go ahead and again, let's, um, Let's do everything, because this thing grows a little bit faster than the linear. Let's go and make everything by 20 and see what happens. So 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, 120, uh, 140, 160, 180. And again, I don't think I'm going to get to figure 20, but that's all right. Okay, so figure one is six. So if my first tick mark is 20, he's going to be like way down here, like way, way down there. And that's okay. Figure two is gonna be 24, so just a little bit above 20, because again, everything's scaled by 20. 
Figure three is gonna be 54, so that's gonna be see 60. So he's gonna be closer to 60 like this. Figure four is 96, so he's gonna be just a little bit under 100. And figure five is gonna be 150, which is gonna be this is 140, so halfway up. And you should end up with again if you were to connect them, and no one is saying that you have to. It should look like this. Now, when you talk about the uh, shape of the graph, the leaning is everyone's going to want to say that it's exponential. And I'll go and put a question mark right there because I'm not sure if that's the truth. It certainly looks exponential because of the curved nature to it. And we all know that the exponential graph grows curved like this. And if you were doing this on your own, then you might have realized a pattern based on what I was doing up here. When I saw this as six technically times one, and then six times four, six times nine, six times 16, six times 25. Now, if I was to actually break this down even further, if you want to look at the number inside the parentheses based on its relationship to the figure, the one comes from figure one, the two becomes a four, the three becomes a nine, the four becomes a 16, the five becomes a 25, and you have to start thinking, what is happening to the five that becomes 25, the four that becomes 16, the three that becomes nine, and so on and so forth. And what you could do is you could really see this as six times two, right, two for figure two, squared, right, to the second power. Six times three, again, for figure three, squared or to the second power. Six times four squared, six times five squared. And eventually, once you establish that pattern, then what you get is an equation of y equals six x squared, where x is the figure number. And if we notice from integrated one, the figure number was always the input of each of those functions. And so that should hopefully make sense. Now, this should hope this might reinforce the notion that the graph we're dealing with is exponential. Why is that? It's because there is an exponent in our function. Now, still, I hold that this would require a, a question mark here. From here, and I don't think we're going to go over this in this lesson because the type of graph that this actually is called uh, doesn't come up for another couple of sections. So for now, exponential with a question mark, I'm actually going to slash that off. If you were just to write down curved, uh, if, you can, if you can spell it right, unlike me, curved, that would be totally appropriate. Some of you guys might already know what type of graph this is called. Uh, if you do, great, write that down, but I'll take curved for now. We will do more investigation of this particular function in a later episode. So uh, thank you for all for watching. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments, and I'll see you in the next lesson.